This speaker is named Neville Johnson. He passed away in September of 2020. But um, for, the, uh, for the past four or uh, five decades, he has uh, had a very close walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ would literally show up and um, take him places, sit down and talk with him, counsel him uh, face to face. And um, a lot of people want a relationship right, like that, but he he was one of the chosen ones to have one like that. He did many missions for the Lord. Um, he, he's been into heaven hundreds of times. Um, he's been into hell to do missions for God, personal missions. He, he's uh, been translated all over the world to do certain things for God. Um, and uh, now he's with the Lord. He's still working uh, for the Lord on the other side of the veil. Uh, within the cloud of uh, witnesses. So he's got a lot, a lot of knowledge. He knows a lot about the future. And he knows a lot about uh, training the the remnant. If you're listening to, to this, then you're probably one of the remnant because uh, the remnant are, um, um, are selected to listen to, to things such as this. And uh, he used to work with, angels used to show up and, and take him places to do things for the Lord also too, and to teach him also too. And he spoke with a number of the, the um, people that you read about in the Bible. And they would sit down and counsel him for hours, like Job uh, and Paul and, and and many, many, many others, um, Enoch and, and such. And uh, yeah, you can check out his uh, website. Uh, it's called the Academy of Light. Um, on YouTube, and he's got a World Wide Web website also, too. I'm not sure what that's called, but uh, check out the link below the Academy of Light and get more in-depth teaching um, also, too. He's, he's got hundreds and hundreds of teachings. And, uh, they were left here uh, by him um, for, for us. So enjoy and learn. Keep learning. Keep praying. Keep walking with God. of Jesus, which are very prophetic and how they are linked to the seven churches. The seven parables are linked to the seven churches and the message of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, like the parable of the sower was linked to the church in Ephesus and so on. The parable of the tears was linked to Smyrna. And today we're going to deal in with the last of the parables, which is the net, which is linked <clears throat> to the church at Laodicea. Now, all those churches existed in the days of John, but they exist today. They were a prophetic foreview of the churches through history. And so this last parable, or parables of the kingdom, is in Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. It says that, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore, sat down, and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So, Jesus said, shall it be at the end of the age, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and they shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay. It talks about a net being cast and bringing in a harvest. Fish in the Bible always speak of um, souls. You know, the Lord said to Peter, I'll make you fishes of men. And, um, and so, two harvests at the end of this age. Good, a harvest of good and a harvest of evil. You know, There'll be a great harvest of souls coming into the kingdom. Multitudes upon multitudes will be saved. And uh, all that has been sown will be reaped in a ver over a very short period of time. And so, the world is on a countdown to the final harvest, the final judgment and the final harvest. Okay? Matthew thirteen forty nine. So shall it be at the end of this age. The angels shall come forth and sever the evil from the good. 
good king. He gathered in, the net brought in, the good and the evil. You know, there is a <clears throat> universal principle that's laid down which affects every one of us, saved and unsaved. And that is the law of sowing and reaping. It's spoken about so often um, in the Bible. Galatians 6, 7, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, you are going to reap. Okay? Proverbs 11 and verse 18. The wicked worketh deceitful work, that him that soweth righteousness, there is a sure reward for that. Okay, that's important. Whatever we sow, there is a reward, good or evil. Now, we need to understand that. Because it's coming to a climax in these end times. Jesus, you know, clearly taught this law in, in Luke 6, 38. He said, given it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto you. So that's the principle. Give, and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now, all of our lives, all of your life, you have been sowing. Now, that's a bit scary. All of our lives, no matter, this week, you have been sowing. It's a frightening reality. Every thought returns to you as a reality. Did you get that? Every thought returns as a reality. Every evil deed, likewise. You cheat someone, you're going to be cheated. It's interesting, you know. And the thing is, with this reality, the return is even greater. What comes out of it? Remember when Jacob ch cheated Esau, his brother, out of his birthright? Um, it's talked about in Genesis 25. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and let it eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. And thus Esau despised his birthright. So, what you sow, you're going to reap. All right? Now, years later, um, in Genesis 27, 19, And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn, and he dis discerned him not because his hand was hairy. Okay, he deceived him. He put on, he had to have a hairy hand, so he put on lamb's wool. So he, he deceived his father, thinking he had the right brother. Now, because of that, it tells us in Genesis thirty-one forty-one. Thus I have been twenty years in your house. I have served you fourteen years for your two daughters, six years for your cattle, and you have changed my wages ten times, cheated him out of his wages ten times. Why? Because he's just reaping what he sowed. Now in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, it says, you know, Good measure, if given, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. You tend to forget these things. Every evil thought returns as a reality, but in a greater way. And so the harvest of sowing and reaping is about to be returned to us big times. Again, Matthew 13, 37. 47 rather, again the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net which cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. Everything's going to be caught in this net. Which when it was full they drew to shore and cast and sat down and gathered the good into vessels were cast about away. Say a day of reckoning is coming and it's coming fast. No matter who you are, whether you're a king, a governor, a pauper, whoever, it all applies. Applies to everyone. Death, you see, equalizes everyone. Kings or paupers, all equal, will give an account to God. So, <clears throat> Romans 14, verse 10. Why do you judge your brother? Or why do you set your brother at no For we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. 
of the words we've spoken, what we have done, who we are. So we're on a countdown now to the end of the age. This net is about to be cast. You know, one thing I've learned through the years, life is very short and the end is coming very quick. Uh, James 4, 4, verse 14, Wherefore, whereas you know not what shall be tomorrow, or what is your life, it's even as a vapor, appears for a little time, and it's gone. That's your life, coming to an end. Every unrepented sin of will return to us. So we've been in a major countdown for the last few years. <clears throat> To this point in time where many things have lain dormant, seeds, prophetic words, things or evil things, things we've done, cheated people, whatever. They, you know, things have lain as seeds in the ground for a lot of years. Those prophetic words over your life, which may not have been come to pass yet, but, you know, they've lain dormant. Laying down for years to this point in time, when things which have lain dormant for generations are now about to be released in this year, the release of the year of Jubilee, the last 50 years, see, the culmination of years of promises, prophecies, words from the Lord are intersecting in this time frame now, expect them to begin to unfold good and bad. Unless you deal with it. Okay, a set time for many things has come. You see, when the rain comes, seed germinates. And the rain is coming. The latter rain and the former rain is coming. The set time for many things. Some of the most profound changes in the church, since the early church, are in the birthing process now. And we need to understand that and be aware, you know. The decisions we make today are impacting on us a lot more quicker than they would have a few years ago. Everything is speeding up. The process of sowing and reaping is in a state of constant acceleration. In other words, returning to us much quicker than it had. The decisions we make will impact upon us much quicker. The things we do, the process of sowing and reaping is in a state of constant acceleration. You know, Amos, so many years ago, right back in the Old Testament, spoke about this. He said in Amos 9, 13, Behold, the days come the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the tree grapes him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Wow, the plowman shall overtake the reaper. In other words, those seeds are germinating so quickly they couldn't keep up. Daniel 12, verse 3, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They shall turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Okay, we're reaching that point in time. The end, the end of the age is upon us. The net is about to be cast. Now, the net speaks of a huge harvest of souls. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net catch in, cast into the sea, gathered of every kind. Okay? So shall it be at the end of the age. The angels. So, the Bible speaks of a huge harvest of souls before he returns. You know, there's a theology out there that only a few will make it. Just a little flock. Well, the Bible doesn't say that at all. There is a massive harvest coming in. And God has planned for this. The Bible clearly indicates this. James 5 and verse 7. He said this, Be patient, be therefore the brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waits. The Lord is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. Who is it? What is this fruit? People. And hath long patience been waiting for this until it received the early and the latter rain. When the early and the latter rain comes, it'll come in one month. And it'll be seven times greater than what the early church experienced. Be patient. 
that's coming, the precious fruit of the earth, souls. You know, there's roughly, well, just over 7 billion people living on the planet Earth today. Didn't you know a child dies every two seconds? It's interesting. Seven billion people. Now, he's planned the greatest harvest at a time when there are more people in the earth than ever before. See, God planned all this. Billions are going to be swept into the kingdom of God. Not just some little flock. Not just waiting to escape and leave the rest to go to hell. Now, there's going to be a net cast and billions will be caught up in that net. New Year's Day this year, I, I had an, a, 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 an experience. That's all I can say. I sat down to read something and I was no longer there. And I thought, well, okay, that happened really quickly and I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't praying. And... Um, <sighs> I was shown in heaven vast areas of vacant land. And I thought, what is this? this I mean, it was beautiful land, high mountains, beautiful valleys, rivers, birds, all kinds of animals, beautiful paradise, more like the outer court. And I thought, well, what is this? And I heard this, all heaven is preparing now. It's been, and paradise, vast areas of paradise are being made ready to receive millions of souls. And I thought, oh, I suppose they would have to prepare for that. You know, you get millions of people suddenly at the gates of heaven coming into heaven uh, at the end of this age. And I think, wow. You know, many of them that die on the the tragedies that are coming upon the face of the earth, but at least they're born again. And vast areas were being prepared. A lot of preparation was going on. And you know, a great task lies ahead for the church. The harvest will be so great, it will bring huge strain upon the church. I know a little about this. When you start to get many hundreds of people saved under a short period of time. That puts strain on you. We had the experience this in the charismatic move. Heaven is preparing for this. Are you, are we? Now this is important. You know, Luke 3, 4, as it is written in the book of the word, uh, book of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. They are preparing are we? The Lord makes straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain shall be brought low. And all flesh, Luke 3, 6, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. All flesh. Now, the Lord wants every new convert properly cared for and quickly discipled. That's going to put enormous pressure on the church. And that's something we have to prepare for now, not when it's happening. We need to start to prepare for now. Every believer is called into this. The order to fill the Great Commission. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen. go into all the world, preach the gospel, all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you right to the end of the age. And so we have this, you know. It says, you know, in, in Matthew 20 and 20, it says, teaching them. What do we teach them? He said, teaching them to observe all things what I have taught you. The teachings of Jesus. That was the agenda. Teaching them everything whatsoever I've taught you. And I'll be with you to the ends of the age. See, God's mindful of this generation. Billions hang in the balance. Heaven and hell. It says Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. Because they fainted and were scattered. And they were like sheep who didn't have a shepherd. You know? You know, the wedding in Cana 
was an interesting wedding. It was prophetic statement to this generation. In John 2, in verse 1, it says, And on the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And it says this, when um, the mother of Jesus was there. Why did it say that? You know? And uh, verse 2, And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Okay. Then we know the story. They ran out of wine. And, uh, and so, you know, they turned the water into wine. The best wine was kept, kept to the end. So, you know, it's interesting. It says the mother of Jesus was there. You see, in the Revelation chapter 12, there is a woman who gives birth to a man child at the end of the sixth day. Are you getting this? You know? The third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. The third day, there was a wedding on the third day. We are now living in the beginning of the third day, 2,000 years from Jesus to now, we're living in the third day, or the seven, beginning of the seventh day from Adam, 6,000 years and into the seventh. We're now living in the beginning of the third day from Jesus, and there was a marriage. Okay, and he reserved the best wine until it last. The mother of Jesus was there. The church, the mother, is going to give birth to a man child in these days. Two thousand years have passed. Six thousand years from Adam. Second Peter three eight. Behold, don't be ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. So the wedding was prophetic of this day. The early church had a great harvest of souls, you know. It was, they brought a lot in. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 says, They that gladly received the word were baptized. That same day were added 3,000 people. And, you know, you've got to remember, they only counted men in those days. So it was a lot more than 3,000. And Acts 5, 14, and says, Believers were more added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Multitudes. But that's nothing compared to what's ahead. Billions are going to be swept into the kingdom of God. Not just millions, billions. And God has reserved the best wine for these last days, the third day. So, the parable of the net is very prophetic. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a net which was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. The end is close. We're coming to that day. If we hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Now, that parable was linked to the Laodicean church. Now, the Laodicean church, Revelation 3.20, was written to a lukewarm church. Remember, there was the Philadelphian church and the Laodicean church. I know your works, Revelation 3.15. I know your works, you're neither hot or cold. I would that you were cold or hot, be one or the other. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and have fellowship with him. Him that overcometh in these days, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father on his throne. If you have an ear to hear, let him hear what I'm saying to these churches. This was written to the, to the last of the seven churches. And so we have a comparison here. The Laodicean church and the parable of the net. Two churches, two types are portrayed. You know, in Revelation, he said to this church, in Revelation Chapter 3 and verse 15, he said, I know your works, you're not hot or you're not cold. I would that you were one or the other. So then because you are lukewarm, not hot or cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods. I have need of nothing. But he said, you really don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. Three different kinds of churches. 
You know, in 19, I think it was 1972, I was in Lima, Peru, and there was this huge, it's a very poor country. I mean, people would, every day would go into the refuge dumps to try and find some food that maybe is being discarded or something they could sell. It's really poor. But there was this big cathedral. And I thought, well, I'll have a look in there. And as I walked into that cathedral, I could not believe it. It was dripping with gold. Gold everywhere in that cathedral. Outside, there was abject poverty. Just a few paces away. And this is, you know, this is, this is what he said. Behold, you say, I'm rich and increased with goods. Now, many Pentecostal churches are even leveling, preaching the prosperity gospel. And I believe in prosperity and all those things. But how much do they help the poor out there? How much do they help the widows? How much do they help those who are in need? You said, I have need of nothing. Well, what about the other people? See, this was the Laodicean church. He says, as many as I love, I'm going to rebuke you. Be zealous and repent. They said this. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and have fellowship with me. He said, You're lukewarm. No commitment. Not even a bond servant relationship. Overemphasis on prosperity. You have need of nothing. We said, Pride and arrogance. Jesus said, If you overcome these things, if you overcome these things which are in that kind of church in the end times, he that overcometh, Revelation 3, 21, I will give to sit with my throne, sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down on my father's throne. He's my father. You say, well, okay, to overcome what's happening in this particular Laodicean church, you get out of that, you do become like that, you change, uh, and you move on and go. He said, if you have the, if you really overcome and come out of that situation, move on into God, he said, you know, there's thrones. There are thrones in heaven. And I always thought, you know, there would be a few thrones, maybe a dozen, half a dozen, 15, maybe 20 thrones, you know, people who are reigning, special people from thrones. But they're not. It's huge, and it's laid up. Many of them are still empty. Most of them, in fact, are still empty. And people ruling with the Lord in the days, some over nations, some over cities, some out into the universe ruling with God. There are all kinds of thrones there. He said, you overcome, who overcometh these things, to him that overcometh I will grant for you to sit with me on one of my thrones. Even as I overcame and I'm sat down with my father on his throne. See, it's open to war. It says many are called, but only a few people prove themselves to be the chosen. That, like Paul said, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. The prize was being seated with the Lord upon the throne. You know? In Matthew 25, 23, he said... Lord said unto them, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you rulers, a ruler over many things. Enter you into the joy of the Lord. See, we're not just, the goal is not just to get to heaven and sit around and have picnics every day. There's a whole world, a whole universe out there, which God rules. Good and faithful servant. Now, Let's bring this to a close. A number of years ago, the Lord said to me so clearly, he said, when I can walk in your garden, you can walk in mine. And I thought to myself, well, what does that mean? And it took me a while. You know, the Laodicean church, see, he was knocking on the outside of that church. He wasn't even in the church. He said he was standing at the door, knocking, trying to get in, but they wouldn't let him in. A lot of churches like that. You know? So he said, okay, if I can walk in your garden, you can walk in mine. I mean, there's some parts of heaven are fantastic gardens. I mean, heaven is another place altogether. 
that, you know, he said the Laodicean church was on the outside of the door. He joined, was knocking. Now, he wants to come in, but why? Simply because you have the wrong plants in your garden. You know, in Song of Solomon 4.13, your plants are an orchard of pomegranates, pleasant fruits, fragrant henna, spikenards, spikenards, saffron, calamus, cinnamon, with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh, of seven fruit of the spirit. So that's your garden. The inference was, unless you have the fruit of the spirit, you can't walk in your garden. The fruit of the spirit is internal and it's your garden. He said, when I didn't walk in your garden, but you have to have the right trees, the right fruit. The Laodicean church had no fruit of the Spirit, so the Lord had no access. When the fruit of this, your Spirit is established within our lives, this is what your garden looks like. Song of Solomon 4.15 a fountain of gardens, or a garden of fountains, living waters, wells, streams flowing in. See, the fruit of the Spirit is far more important than the gifts of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, seven fruit of the Spirit. Many churches are, how can I say this, places of entertainment. with Jesus on the outside. Where the Philadelphian church had an open door, the Laodicean church, Jesus was on the outside. James 5, 7 says, Be patient, be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the Lord, the husband man, waited for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience. Precious fruit, people. The harvest is coming in. He planned this when there's 7 billion people on the face of the earth. And every one, it's it. The gospel we preach to every tribe, every tongue, everyone. You know, there are still huge amounts of territory across this world which have never been explored. Even some close to us here in Australia. Uh, uh, never, ever been explored. New Guinea, there's parts in New Guinea there are tribes in there which which are so remote. You know, you look at the Amazon, many other places. Every person, every person is going to hear the gospel. The Philadelphian church will reap the harvest. Means brotherly love. The precious fruit of the earth are people. Love never fails. It's coming to harvest. The net is going to be cast. Churches, you need to get ready. They have to be taught. And it says, teach them what I taught. The word is to teach them what I taught you. Very important. He specifically said that. Teach them what I taught you. And if you teach them that, they'll go on. They'll go on to a much greater walk with God. Heaven is already preparing for this. Are you? Is your church preparing for this? Everyone has to be disciple. Taught. You can't do that. I mean, everybody is going to be involved. It may have to be done, spread out in home groups. Teach the, the, there'll be so many swept into the kingdom of God. They've got to be taught the words of Jesus. What Jesus taught and let them go. They'll go on from there. This is the last of the churches. Philadelphian church and the church of Laodicea and the net which will be cast across the whole earth. It's coming. And we need to start to get ready now. <laughs>